doing this exercise basically helps you also redeploy things in a smarter way. What Google says is right for human, they're full of shit, in my opinion. Uh, and shit, like GPT 3.5 is like way better than what we had on there, you know. They're just not very smart, basically. Kind of like white hat parasite SEO, you, you'd call it. Mm -hmm. it. It's probably something that the machine learning has picked up on. Google just released a fat core update and all the rules you know about SEO are about to change again. But I'm not going to go over the update now because we've already done it on our news channel. If you want to check the video, click on the card above or check the link in the description. But what we're talking about in today's podcast is very closely related to what's happening now on Google. Now they've started literally de-indexing sites that they deemed low quality. And I'm not just talking about AI sites here. A lot of non-AI sites are also getting caught in the process. My hunch is that now with generative AI, the web is getting a lot larger while not necessarily adding a lot of new information. So Google has to become some kind of curator for websites and just can't maintain an index where all the websites are part of it anymore. And that's what brings us to today's podcast topic, content auditing. I know it may sound boring, but that's the process that might save you from an extinction event during the next update or resurrect your site if you've already been affected. It's the only process that has consistently short results for websites affected by large updates like Panda, Medic, Spam and Core updates, and yes, even HCU, but not the 2023 version yet at the time of recording, but I suspect we'll see them very soon as Google rolls out the new version as we speak. So for example, a friend of ours was affected by the series of Core updates and HCU towards the end of 2023, like many of you, and his traffic went from around 2,600 clicks per day to around 1,300, so about half. And I'm not even counting Christmas because we know traffic is always lower during that period. On first look, his site looks really good, but as we dove into it, we found many issues which we'll go over during this episode. Long story short, we advise him to do an aggressive site audit and no index most of his content to elevate the average page quality. A few weeks later, he de-indexed 90% of his site following our advice, only keeping the best pages that were actually competitive in the index. And what's the result? Well, a few weeks later, his traffic mostly recovered. He jumped up to 2 to 2.2k clicks per day, and he's in a good spot to make a full recovery at this point. And we followed the exact same process on Authority Hacker preemptively towards the end of last year, and we no-indexed 60% of all the pages on the site. During the next core update, our traffic jumped up 30% and jumped up 30% again this January. So do I think content audits are one of the cornerstone SEO activities everyone should carry on? Absolutely. So much so that a few weeks ago, we've shot an entire blueprint about it for our pro members, including pre-made notion templates, tactics and automations to execute things faster and better without cutting corners, checklists and everything you can think of. And so far, people are really loving it. And next week, we will be offering it to every one of our listeners and email subscribers at an 80% discount on authorityhacker.com slash content dash audit. If you go on that page now, you can sign up for the waiting list and we'll let you know when it's available. But whether you buy our blueprint or not, we'll walk you through the whole process in today's episode and why more than ever, this is a good time to look into this. Now, unfortunately, this episode was recorded four hours before the update was announced. So you will hear us talk about how Google hasn't released an update in a while, etc. But this change is nothing to the value of the process and I'd argue it's even more important now. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to thank today's sponsor, Search Intelligence, and we'll tell you more about them a little bit later. For now, let's jump in. Hey everyone, welcome to the Atari Hacker Podcast. Today, we're not going to talk about a very uh, joyful topic and interesting topic, but definitely a topic that is of interest to a lot of people that I think are listening to this episode, and that is recovering from large Google updates. So uh, we're not necessarily going to target HCU specifically here. I mean, I'm not going to come out and say we have an amazing recovery story from HCU. There's not really strong recovery stories from HCU, but there is good strong recoveries from core updates, which have affected a lot of people recently. And in general, how to deal with these large updates that send your traffic down. So you've probably heard it in the pre-intro, we are releasing a new blueprint that helps you prevent and recover from large updates, but we're also going to give you a lot of that in this episode, so feel free to listen to that. Before we jump into the exact step-by-step -step process, we're actually gonna have to establish a lot of things on how Google works and why this methodology is not bullshit, basically, because I think there's a lot of bullshit around recovering sites, etc. And feel free to you know comment under the, the episode, ask us some questions, etc. But I think it's a it's something a lot of people need to do, even if you don't actually get affected by uh, penalties yet, or you, uh, an algo update hasn't affected your site yet, because it's very much a process that helps keep your site clean and lean and remove a lot of essentially bloat from it that could 
cause issues later, which is the main reason why people see these issues happening in the first place. So today's episode, I have Mark. I think, Mark, you're going to mostly be here to like challenge me and be the voice of the people and everything, which uh, I think is good. I think we need to do that because it's such a sensitive topic, right? People people it, care a lot about this. It, it is, and I think you brought up a good point earlier, that this is not just for people who have been hit already, but it's a good prevention technique to run on an annual basis. And, you know, we, we've run that on, on Authority Hacker uh, sort of uh, towards the end of last year. And, it, you know, it, it netted us some pretty good results, right? Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I don't I don't think we've reinvented the wheel here. We merely kind of like built a ni nice process that's easy to follow with some templates, etc. that helps you out. I, but I, it's more about the, the framework that helps you think about this and make the right decisions for your site that I think is valuable. And yeah, we have some case studies. We have cases on the Toy Hacker. We have an anonymous case study. I mean, the guy we helped didn't want me to share his website, so I'm not going to do that. But he did get affected by core updates, lost you know, around half of his traffic, and we covered most of it using this methodology. So we'll show you some graphs on the screen if you want. So I suggest we just get in and we get started, first of all, with some background information on how Google updates work, how, how Google works in general, so we can understand the methodology behind the blueprint, basically. So Google has what we think is two levels of algorithm. One is what I call the light algorithms, which is kind of like the day-to-day -day classic SEO metrics that you'll see around. So, you know, that would be like the domain authorities, the link to page, the keywords that are on the page, the publish date, all the classic SEO stuff that creates the fluctuation in your day-to-day -day rankings. These light algorithms work on the page levels, which means that essentially you can have a page shooting up because you're doing the right thing, you have the right links, you have the right keyword on the page, etc. And you can have another page that does things completely wrong and does not rank well, right? So it's like, you tend to not have massive traffic fluctuations day-to-day -day with this kind of like light uh, let's say legacy algorithms inside of Google that don't cost them much resources as well, which is why they, they can afford to run it all the time. Then you have the heavy algorithm updates, right? These are like the most compute intensive updates where they use kind of like advanced AI and it costs them a lot of money. And it takes a lot of time to roll out as well, right? The last core update took more than three weeks to roll out because potentially uh, it, it, it takes this much resources. These are the tends to be the updates that they announce and that they give names to, right? Yeah. And the thing with these updates recently is that Google has been releasing them uh, as grapes. So it's like, you can see like, for example, the last round of core updates, we got one every three weeks for like, uh, you know, three months and then nothing for more than six months, right? And I feel like potentially it helps them create what I call a fog of war, you know, like in, in Age of Empire, you don't see the map, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then as a result, it, prevent, like it helps them fight spam, basically. Like it's harder to reverse engineer what happens, etc. I don't know if it's that or if it's just they ship it when it's ready. This one, it's like, I can't tell for sure, but it's pretty weird, the timing of a lot of these updates. And they come quite close together Usually, maybe they're tested together though. That's that could be a thing as well. And there was a lot of speculation last year as well that the the updates post HCU were designed to fix some of the damage that uh, apparent damage that HCU <laughs> caused. Yeah, well, that's that's also up for debate. But we actually looked at the the density or the frequency of, of updates, and it was the most uh, updated period uh, and uh, the most number of di uh, days that uh, updates were occurring like since Google has released that data, you know, f like forever, there were sometimes four or five, I think, updates running concurrently uh, at the same time, going over holidays like um, uh, Black Friday, Thanksgiving, that they, they tend to avoid typically doing updates on. So there's a lot of activity. Yeah, but the thing with these updates is that they apply a modifier on your site, and it applies to all the pages on your site, which as a result leads to either very large traffic increases or very large traffic decreases for most people. And it's like some people just see nothing change, basically, it happens as well, right? So it's one of these three cases where it's quite rare that you get like a, a five or 10% traffic increase or decrease from this. Like it tends to be quite drastic. Why? Because it affects all the pages on your site, regardless of the individual quality of the pages in this case. Like Google has just decided, look, this site is like pretty shit. Just let's tank all the pages, basically. And so that's kind of like the core difference between the light algorithm updates and the heavy algorithm updates. The thing with these updates is they can disagree with essentially the legacy factors like the, the links, uh, the keywords on page, etc. So you can do something that essentially rewards you day to day. So you're like, oh, I'm publishing this content and Google is ranking me for more and more keywords and it's working, they're liking it, etc. i.e. publishing a lot of AI content, for example. Um, and then a, a big core update comes out and your traffic goes like, and it's just like tanks completely. Why? Because this core update that is essentially smarter than the day-to-day -day, uh, algo updates 
it essentially disagrees. And and once it looks a little bit deeper in your site, etc., it thinks your site is shit, and therefore it should not rank. Apply the modifier site wide, your traffic tanks completely, which is what we see for a lot of AI content generated sites nowadays. There's quite a few rankings, so but it's been six months. There's been no no proper update as well. Um, but like, but this, this, I was, be this was also applied to a lot of non AI sites. You know, people who had yeah, sites yeah, a lot for of local like sites. five years or, or or more. This 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 affected them, right? And that's really counterintuitive in a way because you're doing something, and it's like especially now, like we're in a period like six months no updates, right? So six months where essentially these light algorithm updates have been deciding the fate of websites, depending if they have no classifier applied to them, like you know you go up or you go down. And so you get no feedback from these smarter algorithm updates at this point. And so what that spells is like potentially large swings next, uh, next time there's one of these updates running because it's been such a long time where you got no feedback from Google on whether you, what you're doing is good or bad, basically. And so that makes SEO very counterintuitive. You have people, you know, posting, you know, Twitter screenshots of GSC of like the last three months or something and be like, oh, look, my, my tactic is working, etc. The reality is they're probably doomed in the next big core update or you know spam update or something like that. But because the classifier hasn't been applied and the dumb algorithms are not smart enough to catch that, yes, they are winning now, but long term they'll pretty much be messed up, basically. And that's kind of like the the difference between like short term SEO and long term SEO is like if you want to do long term SEO, you need to survive like not one of these updates. You need to survive like twenty five of these updates, right? And so you essentially need to play quite safe compared to the people who just want to play the day-to-day -day algorithms and, and, and can take more risk because they're just not very smart, basically. I, so I, 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 I would push back on that and say, you know, they're not okay. very smart. That there, there is... A, a, there are I'm a, talking a, about the algorithms, not the Okay, people. okay, fair <laughs> enough. Because, you know, like the, the, that short-term approach, like the, the rank, and, rank and tank model, as, as, as you said, like, yeah, there's a lot of short-term profit to be made. And it's not illegal as well. Yeah. Like, it's completely legal. Like, publishing content, you're allowed to publish content on the internet. If Google decides to rank it, it's their problem, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. It's like, it's like... It's their editorial decision to rank it. The problem is like the algorithms doing that, they're pretty old right now. They're pretty figured out. And therefore, you know, it's like, it doesn't mean that because you win, you will win the next core update, basically, True. right? So now we've established that, it's pretty basic. A lot of people probably know that already. Let's talk about these site-wide updates. How do they work, right? Most likely what they do is they take a sample of pages on your site. They run it against, a, you know, some kind of AI system that essentially decides is this a good page or is this a bad page? That is probably quite different from the day-to-day -day algorithms. Uh, it's, it's more machine learning, et cetera. So it's gonna be based, for example, on what the quality raters uh, say. So for example, quality raters for six months, they will be visiting you know, sites on the internet and they'll say, oh, this site is very helpful, this site is not very helpful, et cetera. They feed that data to machine learning. And these algorithms, they're like, oh, look, there's a bunch of common factors between all these sites that have been deemed helpful. And it might not be the factors that the quality raters have deemed helpful. So the quality rater, they read the quality rater guidelines. And, you know, they get told about EEAT. They get told about, like, you know, you can understand, uh, like, who is the author, who is behind this, etc. But the algorithm might not you know, understand the website the same way. It just knows it's a helpful website. It's going to look at random factors that are common. So I listed some random examples that the algorithm could be using, for example. So I don't know if you know, but if you're, if you're a tech nerd like me, you know, fonts on your website, the size can be determined in different ways, right? You can determine the size in pixels, which is kind of like the legacy way. So it's like 18 pixel, nine pixel, very much like Microsoft Word. Most people build their site that way. The problem with that is it's not very accessible. If I have poor vision and I increase the base font size on my browser, 18 pixel is always 18 pixel, and I can't read very well. So the modern way of building websites is to use uh, is to use kind of like relative values called EM and REM, right? And these allow you to scale the font based on the base font size of your browser. So it's like 1.2 REM. You know, it's like instead of like if my base font size is 16, it's like 16 times 1.2. If my base font size is 20, it's 20 point one, uh, times 1.2. Makes my site accessible to people with poor vision, right? It's very likely that size dim that's helpful, large sites, you know, like Forbes, etc. It's very likely that these sites have implemented these accessibility features like the font size, for example. And it's very likely that the machine learning could be like, oh, look, all these size dim helpful are using REM for font size instead of using pixels like most of these niche sites that are using it the legacy way and don't, didn't really learn about these new ways of making sites accessible. And so 
while the quality rater has identified EEAT, the machine learning has identified REM as a font size factor to actually decide that, oh, this is a helpful site, right? While looking at the same site. Uh, another thing might be the cookie consent thing that actually Cyrus study showed recently was a positive uh, ranking factor in the recent HEU, right? Sites that had a cookie consent in the EU tended to not do as bad after the HEU as sites that did not have one. It's probably something that the machine learning has picked up on, that the quality raters didn't deem as helpful, but the sites that are helpful tend to have a cookie consent uh, uh, box, for example, right? To, to play devil's advocate on that one, that that could very much, that feels like it's very much like a correlation causation question. Yeah, and but like, that's exactly how these machine, these machine learnings work. Right? Yeah, it's right. Like the, so the, be them... the better quality sites that care about their content, that care about everything else, they do the things that they're supposed to do legally. Yeah, it makes sense. And so as a result, Google is actually rewarding the REM font size or whatever because it correlates very highly with good EEAT, for example. And talking about EEAT, like, you know, a lot of sites now have these kind of like content reviewers, so they don't just show the author, they show the reviewer. My belief is that initially this was not a ranking factor, right? Uh, that like all this stuff, like it was very hard for Google to determine how legit this is. However, if you go on large quality sites, like Healthline, like Forbes, whatever, they all have it now. They, they have an author, they have a reviewer, right? So now there's a correlation between sites that are winning the SERPs and the sites that have a reviewer on their content, right? And therefore, it's not because Google is verifying or having some crazy algorithm thing or whatever. It's just the fact that Google associates now having a reviewer with your content with a quality site. Therefore, EEAT becomes a factor, but it becomes a factor because of Google's PR effort to push EEAT and big sites adopting it and correlating with essentially being, uh, being good sites rather than Google coming up with some super fancy way of evaluating EAT. So EAT is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? I, I've seen that mentioned before. We, we talked about this um, in, in uh, various niches, like the VPN niche, a great example of this, that there's maybe a couple dozen popular VPN companies and like ExpressVPN, Nord, or you know, the, the, the two that are, you know, I guess, promoted uh, a lot Surfshark as well as a, a big one and it's kind of like if you don't mention those big ones in any of your articles you're yeah. like you're missing you know you some of the re yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah it's interesting but like you see how EEAT can go from like like essentially a, a wish from Google that people buy into edit their sites and now quality writers flag these sites that have this stuff as helpful therefore the machine learning knows how to recognize the EAT through correlation right uh, in my opinion, this is very much how this works. And that kind of like reconciliates the people who are like, how does this work technically? And like, how does Google verify your claims? I don't think they do. But like potentially the badges on your page and all that stuff, et cetera, that is visible uh, correlates with being a high quality site. And I'm not sure it's saying it's going to fix all your problems, but it's one of the things that might be associated with you being a higher quality site during these core updates. Similarly with uh, user metrics, like user engagement metrics, right? It's like, for example, a site that has been deemed helpful might have a time between the person clicks on the result and the person comes back to the sub of two minutes and 30 seconds, right? It's like, we know that. And then Google can benchmark that time of your site against that time on the site that they know is helpful because a human reviewed it. And then they see how far off you are, you know? And it's like, for many reasons, people could be spending less time on your site. One of the main reasons I think is most people's site look absolute trash on mobile, for example. Uh, whereas large sites look very good on mobile and most traf traffic is mobile these days. And if you essentially have lower time on page because your site is a poor experience on mobile, even if your content is great, it's like, you know, a lot of people be like, oh, but my content is great. It's better than these big sites, etc." People are potentially staying less on your site and therefore you're deemed unhelpful, even if uh, your content and the words you have on your page and the photos and everything are great. Same with over monetization, right? It's like it could, it could fuck you over if there's ads everywhere, people click back too early, that essentially messes your site. So think about this as like Google taking the benchmark that is set by quality raters and then putting your site against them for many, many, many metrics and then deciding how close you are to them to de determine if you're a helpful site or not. Now, I don't think Google looks at all the pages on your site. I think that would be very expensive. 
Um, they probably look at the pages they send the most traffic to, which essentially is what affects them the most, right? They take their visitors, they send it to your website. They want this to be a good experience. So most likely, and that's kind of the good thing with the audit, right? It's like if you kind of like do, you can 80, 20 it if you want. You can kind of review like yeah, your top pages and fix them. And, and you like, it probably is a lot more helpful than doing everything. There's kind of diminishing returns as you do that, which is nice because doing an audit is, is pretty heavy uh, and time consuming actually. It's so a you grind can, you for can, sure. Yeah, so you can 80-20 it, basically. But basically, that's the idea. Google uses something like a quality score. So quality score is actually something bought by, from AdWords. So I don't know if you know, but when you do AdWords, when you do Google Ads, Google actually assigns a score between uh, 1 and 10 to your landing page, matching with your keywords. And it's trying to decide like how closely you are matched. And the better you match, the lower your CPC. So you pay less for your ads. And if it's, you do, it's done this do for better. decades. For a long time. This isn't yeah. a new thing. Yeah. That's what we kind of like borrowed from Google, the quality score idea. And so our whole auditing system essentially revolves around assigning a quality score, assigning a an average quality score target. So I usually tell people like, you want all the index pages on your site to be at least a seven out of 10, you know? And if and you know, we have a whole scoring system for that, et cetera. And then anything that's below seven out of 10, you're gonna have to do something about it basically, because that's what's bringing your average down. That's kind of the reason for all these explainer. Yeah, go ahead. One thing that's really important here, because you know, most people I speak to are like, oh yeah, I have great content. Uh, and mm. that <laughs> there's a couple of things. Like often people don't realize how their content is. Maybe th there's a gap between what they have and what's currently ranking uh, at the top of the SERP. Or even if when you created that content, it was really good, best in, in the world. SERPs change very quickly, especially in competitive spaces. People are updating the their articles, intent, creating yeah. new new content. The search intent itself changes. So that's why you really need to go through this regularly at least once a year uh, to, to kind of reevaluate things because it's very easy to create a process to, to create content, much harder to create process to constantly evaluate and, and analyze it. There's actually more to that as well. There's also like from an SEO perspective, like let's forget Google for a second. There's also kind of like strategic decisions that probably made sense at the time when you made them. So trying to rank for a keyword, for example, and now you have like a bunch of DR90 size ranking for that query. It doesn't make sense yeah. anymore. And quite often, a lot of your link profile is pointed at places where you have no chance of ranking. So these audits, and we'll talk about link profile redeployment, is a big thing as well. And I think it's a big thing in terms of recovery. It's not just recovering your rankings, it's kind of re-optimizing your assets as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, big deal and that has helped us a lot. I might give an example later. Uh, on some of the stuff we've done around that, but it, doing this exercise basically helps you also redeploy things in a smarter way towards keywords you actually have a chance to rank for, especially after large updates, right? It's like when Reddit ranks for everything, I'm telling you, there's many keywords on your on your site you're targeting, you can't rank, like it's just, you can't anymore. And, uh, and it's a bit of a painful realization, you know, you're like, oh, I could easily rank for this before, but now I can't. Think for Atari Hacker, we had like best keyword tool for, like we were number one for best keyword tool for a long time, right? Now, good luck. It's like the R95 size ranking for it. We can't rank for it. It's, it's unfortunate, but just it's not possible. And so we redeployed, you know, we had 100 plus linking root domains to that best uh, keyword tool page or something. Uh, earned through actually making a good review. Um, and uh, and we redeployed them to a page that I can actually rank. I can't remember which page. I think it's pointed to the topical authority page now or something like this, like something that's like semi-related, you know, that we can actually rank for. And so we kind of like keep doing that dance with other sites when we can't beat them. We just dodge them instead of trying to and this confront is, them. This is know? a really interesting point <laughs> as well, because we're not just making SEO decisions here, but we're making business decisions here. Because yeah. ultimately traffic, we all say is a vanity metric. Like it doesn't matter how much traffic you have, it's how much money you generate from that. So if you're able to redirect some of this link juice to to pages which can bring you leads or sales or whatever it is you're, you're going for, then you know, it's, it's a much better thing to do than, than having this, uh, this, these links go to a page that has no chance of, of even being anywhere close to page one. Yeah, I mean, I suggest we jump into the audit process because sure. now we're kind of like chipping at it, but we're actually not getting into it. Before we keep going with the interview, here's a quick word from our sponsor, searchintelligence.co.uk.
How much do you think this digital PR campaign is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. Watch as we hijack the news. We tell you Swift and Barbie to get you the links. Now we can take this data set from ONS and paste it right into your emails to get you the links. Now how much do you think this campaign is worth? Don't answer. Wait until you see Bloomberg, BBC, Forbes, top tier national and regional news outlets. Reactive PR, data PR, expert commentary, over 70 team members at your disposal. This product is so hot I need a fan. And then... Listen to what campaigns we do at no extra charge. Gain character wages, bananas and sleep, best dates for dogs, luckiest UK areas, and many more. All for just how much did you guess? 10,000? 20,000? Even more? No! It's just 5,500 pounds. That's right. It's five and a half grand. It's an incredible value, but it's true. It's digital PR from Search Intelligence. Order today, P.O. Box, searchintelligence.co.uk, except B2B clients. Thank you, Search Intelligence. If you want to start a digital PR campaign with their help, head over to searchintelligence.co.uk. Now, let's get back to the interview. So we just spent, I'm looking at my time on here, we talked for 20 something minutes <laughs> about how Google works. Like now the question is like, how do I solve this update? That's why I click on, on the podcast, what are you talking about? Let's talk about this right now. Uh, and we're going to talk about the whole process. And for those of you who want to see us do it, who want the templates, etc., that's when you might be interested in a blueprint. Otherwise, we'll give you a bunch of info here and, uh, and you can try it yourself. But basically, if Google is going to sample pages on your site and give them a quality score, we're going to do the same with our auditing process, right? We're going to go through essentially all the indexed pages on our website. Uh, and I, it's very precise, index, not all the pages. So if you have no index stuff, it doesn't matter. And no indexing stuff works. As we could see from the anonymous case study that I showed, actually he no-indexed 90% of the pages on the site and his traffic went up actually. Um, so no-index is going to be an option. And your role is going to be going through your pages that essentially are low quality score and either delete them. So if they have no traffic and no links, we tend to delete them because they add very little value. Uh, unless you maybe have a realistic shot at ranking for the keyword, but that's where you reevaluate your keywords. Redirect them. So if a page has no traffic but links, you're much better off redirecting that page to a page that has a shot at actually getting traffic. You can update the page. So essentially, if the page is valuable for your business, it can help you make sales, etc. And some of the content is salvageable, then we do a content update, which is essentially you keep the core of the content and you just fix it, you patch it up basically. Or you can rewrite everything. That's when nothing's salvageable, but the page is valuable to you. Uh, or you can no index pages. So we do that when the page is valuable, uh, to the user, but we don't think that's what Google is looking for. So for example, an example is like a lot of people like republishing their newsletter on their site, right? Um, it's cool and everything, um, but the truth is it, it tends to not be deemed as a high quality page by Google. Like what Google says, right, for human, they're full of shit, in my opinion. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the truth is these kind of like dumb algorithms very much rule uh, the core of how Google works and they want like an article that's structured the way it's supposed to be structured, et cetera. And, and you, yeah, you're not really rewarded for posting content for humans at this point. I hope they fix that at some point. Uh, but at this point, I would no index it actually. Or you can repurpose stuff. Uh, and I'll give you an example uh, recently on, on stuff that I repurpose. Repurposing is basically content that might not be good enough for your domain. Let's say you're like, DR30 or something, and you're trying to rank for keywords, so either the keyword is too difficult or the content is not good enough for your quality threshold, then you might be better off using this as a guest post or potentially using this as Parasite SEO, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, so that's essentially the process of auditing, like the, the very wide process. I'm going to talk to specifics in a second. Uh, for Atari Hacker, yeah, we removed 100 blog posts uh, that we either deleted or redirected. We even removed an entire category. You know, we had a funnels category and this is gone from the site now. Uh, mostly because we found that 90% of the content in that category was not on the standards we wanted. And so we've deleted, I think like 40 or 50 articles from this category. The writer was probably one of our worst writers, to be honest. And uh, we were making money. That's the thing. We kind of like gave up on some affiliate commissions on, on, on active campaign and so on. but. Um, we felt that it could be the cause for the site dropping in an, in an update in the future. So we decided to not take that risk. It was worth it. Yeah. We know index 300 podcast pages as well. It's kind of a, a difficult one because several people want to find the podcast on Google, but Google doesn't like our podcast pages because podcast show notes tend to be very thin. There's low value on them. Uh, and so therefore it kind of like brings your average quality score down, right? It's like if you took an average page on a Toyaka with the podcast pages, 
probably the median page is a podcast page, right? So it means like it, you take ha like you cut halfway through the page count, you land on a podcast page. It's not a great page. Uh, it's it's not reflective of the content we put on the blog elsewhere. So we we didn't want this to bring down the average quality. Bam, no indexed everything. Uh, and if you put Autoria Hacker in Ahrefs, you'll see the number of index pages dropped quite a lot when we did this. Uh, we still are in the process of updating and rewriting dozens of pages following this process as well. And we're testing repurposing. So I'll give you an example of repurposing. That's a, that's a funny one. So we had, a, uh, in our funnel section actually that we deleted, we had uh, an article on Thrivecart review, right? So Thrivecart is the shopping cart we're using. You know, some, day, some days we love it, some days we hate it. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that. Still pretty decent if you're getting started because there's no subscription, which is nice. Uh, but the point is the review was outdated. It was four or five years old. And, and when we did the audit process, one of the points is like, is the content up to date? And in this case, it was clearly no. Uh, we were missing lots of new features. It wasn't very good, et cetera. So we unpublished it. Um, but Strivka, we've made money from, from this review, right? It's like, uh, I think, I mean, I checked, I think there was over 20 grand of commissions on the uh, affiliate dashboard, right? So I was like, ah, that's kind of, that kind of sucks to kind of keep up on, on these commissions. Uh, but I, we just don't have the resources to redo that review properly. I don't think we have a writer that specializes enough in shopping carts to do justice to that review. So we removed it from our site to essentially increase our quality score. But I recently republished it on LinkedIn, which is a, basically an, a completely unmoderated <laughs> DR98 domain where you can post anything you want, including your affiliate link CTAs, anything. Three days later, that review is now ranking higher than it ever did on notoryhiker.com. And we can reap the benefits of essentially the trickling commissions from the Strive Cart review that we had without damaging the average quality score of the site. We do lose a little bit on email subscribers and retargeting data, et cetera. Like it's not perfect, um, but like that's what I'm talking about with repurposing. That's why you can be a little sneaky. Like, I mean, Google's being sneaky with us. I don't, I don't feel bad for repurposing. Like essentially it's not a sneaky review. The, when the user lands uh, on the review is the same experience we had on Atari Hacker, except it's on LinkedIn, basically. So that's an example of, of repurposing here. Is that something you recommend doing for, for most people or is that mostly just a fun experiment? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. But the thing is, it works super well. It works way too, it's too easy. Like three days later, we were ranking, like I outrank the 75 plus sites that have had a, a, a better, a more dated review for years. Just putting it on LinkedIn right now. Uh, and I mean, I don't know if it will still rank when, when we release this podcast, but right now it's ranking for everything. So it's like potentially, um, potentially, that, but I don't think it's going to last. Like I think LinkedIn is either going to put some kind of moderation system in place uh, or Google is going to not reward them as much because it's just like, it's a short term game yeah. basically. Um, but like, again, like if LinkedIn stops ranking, I can take it off LinkedIn and put it somewhere else. Basically the idea of rep repurposing is like, I have a piece of content. What do I do with this? It could be a guest post, it could be posted on another domain, whatever, whatever serves my business goals really. And, uh, and my, my kind of like code of ethics is like, as long as I'm not cheating the, the user, the, the reader of the article, I'm okay with it. Basically, as long as like, if I'm not selling some shitty product, if the advice is the same that I would give on Atari Hacker, et cetera, I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. I don't think it's detrimental to the internet and to the users and I'm, it's, it's fine. So it's like kind of like white hat parasite SEO, you, you'd call it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I mean, play with the current set of rules, right? Uh, anyway, let's go back to the audit process because uh, that is just one of the things. So. How do you actually do this? How do you actually do this auditing, et cetera? Well, the first thing you need to do is collect a list of all your index pages, right? So uh, there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, a lot of people will recommend GSC, but I actually prefer using the free version of Ahrefs. Uh, free version, please don't, don't negative comment us. Uh, <laughs> no, no credits necessary. <laughs> no credits. <laughs> um, why? Because there's actually a lot of very useful metrics uh, in Webmasters. Uh, Webmasters? tools from Ahrefs, I think. Uh, it's the, it's the, free, the free plan, basically. And so it allows you to not only just get your index pages, but you can get their linking root domains, you can get their top keyword, and you can get their organic traffic. It's like you can, you can get some of that in GSC, but you, you're missing the, the link data particularly. Now, if you want to be more precise, you can take both data, the GSC data and the Ahrefs data, and just do a quick VLOOKUP on the URL level 
to bring the GSC data for the for the clicks, while you can use the linking root domains, etc., from Ahrefs and have more precise data, basically. So once you have that spreadsheet, basically it's a CSV, uh, you import that into a Notion template. This Notion template is available in the Blueprint. That's kind of a benefit for buying the Blueprint, is that you actually get the the, the Notion template. So I'll tell you how you do this, but I if you want if you want it done for you, buy the Blueprint, basically. Um, and so you import that data into uh, a Notion database that essentially is pre-built for you. And that Notion database is already pretty smart. It's doing a bunch of work for you. So, you know, it's going to bucket together all the pages that you should be considering deleting. So that's pages that have no links and no traffic, for example. The pages you should consider redirecting because it's going to look at link your domains and traffic. So if you see that you have links but no traffic, for example, it'd be like, hey, here's a bucket of pages you should consider redirecting. It's also going to make a bucket of pages you consider, should consider doing nothing with, right? Because obviously sometimes pages are good. You don't need to change everything. Uh, and so like if, it, if you rank like in the top five for your target keyword, et cetera, it's going to bucket all these pages together and you can quickly flag them as like, okay, 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 okay. And that saves a lot of time with the audit because, you know, using these metrics, it does 80% of the work. You should still check it. It's not perfect. Um, like, especially on the deleting side, like sometimes you, even if a page has no organic traffic, it might have like internal traffic that is not reported in Ahrefs, for example, or like, you know, a page that explains your business model, your about page, things like that. Like don't delete this <laughs> for that reason. And it's okay to keep them indexed as well. Um, so that's, that's the thing. Now, once you've made that database of all your index pages in Notion pretty quickly using Ahrefs and, and GSC, you need to start grading your pages like Google would, basically. So again, we have prepared a big checklist for that is essentially created for every single page on the page level. So you have your database in Notion. Every time you open the page, you have a checklist and you can go through this and tick what is working, what is not working. I'm going to give you a bunch of elements that are in the checklist. I'm going to not give you the whole checklist because that's part of the product. But let's just talk about some of them. So for example, and when we were talking about business decisions, that's actually one of them. It's like the page targets a keyword I can realistically rank for. Uh, again, that means go and Google your keyword again, check who's above you. Can you beat these people or not? Or are they DR95 sites and you can beat them? It's, less, it's time to be realistic for a lot of people. Like it's like a lot of keywords got closed down. If you, the, the, the faster you realize that, the faster you can reutilize these resources of the content and the links pointing to that page to something that's actually going to be productive for your business, right? Uh, and then there's like the page matches the search intent. So does the format of the article match the kind of format of articles you see on page one? Uh, the page ra ranks well and gets traffic for its intended keywords. So if not, obviously that's not working. And the page generates good conversions as well. And I think that's one that a lot of people kind of miss on. So like this industry is obsessed with traffic and GSC data and very, very little obsession for how much money does that make them. Uh, and, so, and so what I want to say is that it's quite important that if you've been ranking for a while, if you have, if you have uh, historical data on you know, that page, you need to go and look back how much money you've made from this or how many conversions you've made from this. Because while you may be able to rank for that keyword, if that's making you no money, please, please, please redirect that page, reuse that content somewhere else and actually make it something productive for your business rather than uh, just, you know, ego inflation through SEO and GSC data. Because, I mean, I'll tell you for us, like we, had, we have periods where sometimes we have way more traffic than usual, but our conversions are not as high and vice versa, where the traffic is not as high, but conversions are very good, for example. So traffic is not conversions and, and you should go look back at that. And it, it can be quite difficult to measure this some, sometimes. I know uh, Amazon used to give you a report where it would actually show you yeah, yeah. Um, how much money each page was was making, but they took it away for some reason. Um, I know other platforms, or other affiliate platforms allow you to do this. If you're selling your own products, there are much more advanced tools. Like we use a company called Segmetrics uh, to, to do this. And it actually tracks kind of leads coming around and then as they, as they go through your sales funnel and eventually buy so you can see where the people who purchased your products, which organic pages they uh, they came from. Yeah, uh, you also can use um, like tracking IDs, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's like- It gets that's, really that's messy like, really quickly if you start having a lot does, of those. It does, yeah. But, yeah. I think uh, Lasso has a free analytic tool as well where they, like I think you can track up to some, a few thousand dollars a month of uh, affiliate income for free and then they charge you, but it's, yeah, check the price. I don't remember the price. I'm not gonna say if it's a good deal or not because I haven't checked. Um, but I know there are tools now that help you with that for affiliate. And if you don't, if you have your own products, like 
you definitely need some analytics set up properly. And that's kind of like the higher level. It's like, is it even worth putting any kind of effort into that page? Like, do I even want to recover that page? Um, because quite often the answer would be no. And it's like, I'd rather my writers try something that might work rather than work on something that's sure to not work, you know? Um, and so it, this is kind of like the high level. Obviously we need to go back to more like SEO considerations as well. Uh, the next one I have is the pages related to my site's main topic or activity. I think that's a big one as well because a lot of people, you know, they do well in SEO and they're like, oh, this site is rocking. Let's just put some more content onto it. And then they kind of like expand way beyond the original scope of their site. That's what happened to the anonymous case study that we talked about as well. Uh, he expanded quite a bit beyond his original scope. And as a result, well, he took a, he took a hit. It kind of dilu it, dilutes it a bit really, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's the problem. It's like, I think it's, I mean, I think when you're growing, it's kind of fine to kind of like slowly expand your scope because otherwise you might run out of topics to talk about. But when you're shrinking, it's also important to understand that you need to reduce your scope and go back to your roots because that's what Google knows your site for. That's what most of your links are relevant for. And essentially rebuilding that kind of like core relevancy is very important for sites to come back actually. And so like, while like most people have accepted the fact that they can expand their scope when things are going well, very few have accepted the fact that they need to reduce their scope when things are not going well. And it's, you know, follow, follow the analytics curve basically on knowing whether you can, you need to recenter on your topic or if you can expand basically. Um, if you win the last score update, yeah, maybe you can expand. If you lose the last score update, then, then kind of like recenter on what you're doing, right? Uh, the next one is like the content is up to date and accurate. I mean, pretty pretty obvious, but what that means is, especially on competitive SERPs where people are updating their content very often, uh, you know, the search intent is a moving target, right? Um, it's not it's not a fixing. So it's like what it was when you wrote the article versus what it is today is probably quite different. And it's quite easy to take your eyes off that um, when when you're not paying attention to a page. It's ro it's doing well. It's rocking, etc. You're busy with something else. Um, but that's that's the time to kind of like relook at that and, and be honest about it. Like, you know, is the product I reviewed, the, is there a new version? Did they do some updates? Uh, did, was there some kind of mass recall for this product that I did not cover? Or has everyone else just written better reviews than you now and you don't stand a chance? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it also goes under, under the page um, target secure that can realistically rank for that, that part, I would say. Um, and so we, like, we saw a lot of that with helpful content uh, update as well. So where there would be 10 affiliate sites on page one, there was maybe one or sometimes zero on page one. And then you just had, you know, Reddit, Quora and a bunch of random e-com sites, which also kind of had shitty, shitty content, but that's yeah. a, another question there. Well, it's also the search intent and like, you know, type of site ranking is potentially part of the search intent, right? Yeah. It's like, is yeah. it all e-com sites ranking then? you know, maybe my content site is not really welcome right now, at least hopefully when it changes with updates, we will be better. But like, it's just time to be realistic on a lot of these things, you know? Um, so that's that's one of them, like up-to-date and accurate. Quite often you'll realize how outdated your content is as you just spend the time just on this point. Then the next one I think is, is really one where a lot of people are failing and is the page is well formatted. It looks good on all screen sizes. Emphasis on all screen sizes is like most people build their site on desktop. They look at their site on desktop. They never experience their site on mobile, and it's a shit show. Like you need to change the size of your fonts on H2s, etc. On mobile, you need to do all these things. You need to have, to have set up all these rules on your site because otherwise, it's not good. It's not good enough. The spacings, etc. Like you need to to set all this stuff up. Otherwise, you don't have a good experience on mobile, for example. And Google is mobile first now. There's no wall of text as well. And no rule of text on mobile, um, which is very different as rule of text on desktop because you can fit, you know, six mobile screens on one desktop screen, you know, something like this. And so what that means is like, while the page might look good when you browse it in your browser, if I open it on my mobile and it's all like shrunk, uh, like horizontally, like, holy shit, like you could be scrolling like four, five screens of words and words and words and nothing. And it's, this is how people drop off your page. Like when I was talking about Google looking at like average time on site versus like, you know, sites that have been, de been deemed helpful, that's one thing that uh, could potentially mess you up with these helpful content updates, et cetera. So it's like evaluating that for all screen sizes. So that means right click on your browser on your page, inspect, and you can click on the device on the top right of the settings panels and you can set responsive or you can even select a device. So like I usually do the, take the iPhone 12 Pro, I think, 
and it just sizes like it's an iPhone 12 Pro, right? And it's like, I see, and I'm scrolling through and I'm kind of looking at the experience. And most people don't do that. And, and I'm telling you, I think that's a big, 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 big reason a lot of people got messed up and a big, big, big reason why, why large sites are ranking well because they actually put effort into their mobile experience. Quite often, you go on a false page, and it looks very different on mobile and desktop. Like you have like more collapsible parts on mobiles, right? Like they, they have this accordion thing that like expand, like that, that collapse on mobile and then that expanded on desktop, for example. And as a result, like you see a full article on desktop, but you go on mobile, and it's like you can actually scroll the page in like three swipes and just expand the section you want, for example. So that's the kind of like mobile UX stuff that is becoming essentially search intent as it's correlating with size deemed helpful, you know? It's also like it tie, ties back into the, the, when you're creating content as, as well, like this whole notion, you know, I know I hammer on about it a lot of like fluff content and intros, especially we, we talked about a lot. Um, being super long and and just unnecessary, so it's, it's even more so on mobile. Like people search for something, you just want the answer. So like, give it to them and give it to them fast. Like the time to value is super important there. Yeah, and just the formatting. Like a lot of these comparison tables, they look shit on mobile and so on. Like it's like it's yeah. It's I mean we had several members. Like we had uh, a platinum event, a uh, pro platinum event, talking about this process, and I had many members come back to me. Uh, like I they, I opened their site on the call. Yeah, I'm like. I'm sorry, but it's just not great, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then they came back to me, and they just like they fixed it. Like you know, they, it, it helps them identify this stuff basically. Uh, another one I have is the page is not over monetized or promoting shady companies. Now the shady companies one is an interesting one because it's funny how the world of SEO is very very excited about the idea of semantics, entities, etc. When it comes to optimizing your page, but not so much when it comes to the companies you're mentioning in there that might have negative sentiment associated with them, bad reviews, et cetera. If you are the person that pushes this stuff, if Google is using all the semantic stuff to evaluate your pages, they probably use that semantic stuff to evaluate the reputation of the people you're associating yourself with as well through your entities. And therefore, uh, you know, size that First of all, sites that have lots and lots of affiliate links tend to have done worse recently, like kind of like tone it down, same with ads basically. And I think sites that have been essentially associating themselves with shadier companies, unless they're large sites, like you'll find like an Outlook India <laughs> article promoting the shittiest uh, diet pills right now and, and maybe ranking. Uh, Outlook India is not doing so hot uh, recently, but still like you get the idea, like being a large site, you know, forgives you all your sins, basically. But if you're not a large site, it's important, basically. And so like, I want to address that because people are going to like come back in the comments, be like, oh, but I see this large site ranking for this keyword, etc. Yes, that's true. That's how Google works right now. They need to fix that. There's a problem. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that that's how they judge your smaller site, potentially. So that's pretty much like grading your page, right? So you go through this checklist and you have a grading system. You, grade, you, you do grade your page the same way Google would, basically. Uh, and so you're able to see which pages are below your seven. And then that tells you like, look, I need to do something about that, right? And that's exactly the next thing. It's making decisions in the process, right? So once you've gone through the checklist, it helps you to have more of a honest view about the page and see its shortcomings. Like it, it's kind of like a conscious, conscious check, you know? And I, I, that's what I wrote in the notes. Like everyone thinks their content is great until they look more closely, you know? Yeah, because, no. it's true. Uh, I, and it was the case with the anonymous case study as well, right? We had a call with him and I think most people would say his site's pretty good, even though he got affected. But when we looked closer, like yeah. I thought it was great. I looked closer, I was like, man, it's just not, like your reviews could be quite a bit better, actually. Yeah. Like it's missing a lot of information and so on. Uh, it's not that up to date. And, and, and that helped him kind of like take a step back and be like, oh shit, I need to do something about it. Maybe I was great at one time and then now maybe I kind of fell behind, you know? Yeah, that's, that's the thing, like a large part, a large part of this is uh, competition and qu uh, content quality, especially, it just gets better over time as people yeah. level up, adapt, learn from what other people are, are doing. Copy and your content. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> you know, you know while, while, it, while you were the best in the world three years ago, you know, it's often not the case today. And you, that's yeah, why I call it's it so content inflation. To, yeah, it's a good, good way of describing it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I go back. Uh, I'll talk. I know you don't like talking about it, but sometimes I go back and check uh, health ambition, and I'm like, shit. Like GPT 3.5 is like way better <laughs> than what we had on there, you know. <laughs> and it's like, that's the perfect example of content inflation, right? It's like it's it's 
you go back to a site you built like seven, eight years ago. Yeah. And I agree, AI content is better than that. So essentially, that's the gaps in the market you can take with AI content because definitely it does a better job. But uh, but yeah, so it's like it's it's these things like they're not forever basically. Uh, nothing's forever except diamonds, I guess. But uh, anyway, once you have gone through that checklist, <laughs> uh, we made an interactive flowchart that helps you essentially decide the best path for your page. So again, I'm not gonna give the whole flowchart because essentially it's the course. But I'm going to give you an example, right? So we're going to go through one. Uh, I put the screenshot on the page and we go together. So one of the first questions is, is the page older than six months? And you just answer yes or no, right? Um, if no, we tend to tell people like, look, give it a little bit of time. That page probably needs to age a little bit before you decide to slash it or, or do something with it. Then it's like, does the page rank top three for its targeted keyword? You can say yes, you can say no. If you want to know what's behind yes, you're going to have to buy the blueprint. Um, then it's like, is the keyword unique and important to you? And can you realistically rank for it? And that's where you essentially go back and Google the keyword. You see who's ranking and you're like, you know, do I have a chance? Can I, can I actually rank? Uh, let's say in this case, we say no, right? If you say yes, it might be different. But if you say no, uh, does the page has valuable links pointing to it? Because we know it can't rank for its unique keywords, basically. Um, but there might be salvageable parts that we can go after here. And th this is an interesting point, actually, because a lot of people, they will leave a uh, article that doesn't rank and is out of date and is yeah, not good it's wasted. because it has links and they want that links for their domain, essentially. Uh, but even though it's not helping that page. But man, redirects are so powerful. It yeah. works so well, actually. Like I'll talk, Maybe I'll give an example of redirect after. So like in this case, I put, yes, there is links pointing to it, so it's interesting. And it's like, is, there, is this page valuable for your business outside of SEO? And the, uh, the reason I'm asking that is like sometimes these pages are still like worth it if they're like high convert. Like imagine you have a squeeze page, for example, right? It doesn't rank for a unique keyword or can't rank for anything. It has links pointing to it because people have been promoting it or you've been promoting it online. I'm not going to cut my squeeze page to, uh, to just salvage some links. However, however, I could take the content of that squeeze page, put it somewhere else and redirect that link with all the backlinks somewhere else. It depends on how the traffic comes in basically. But like you can be sneaky a bit like, uh, that's actually a tactic that we've done. So for example, I think we had an old blog post from Perrin, right? Perrin's case study on um, HipHop, his website that he built uh, and sold, right? This, site, this, this page had like 100 plus linky root domains, but it's a great story for Atari Hacker. Like I don't want to get rid of it. It's kind of like part of our legacy, et cetera. Like it's, it's interesting. So what we did is we took the content of that page and we just put it on a new URL that has no links. And we took the original URL with 100 linking root domains and we pointed it to a page that actually has a chance for ranking. So we kind of like get, in French, we say the butter and the money from the butter, uh, <laughs> which is essentially, we get, we get to use the, link pro, the links more efficiently while keeping the legacy page and the content we want on the site. You know? I, th I think the, the English saying is, have your cake and eat it too. Okay, well, pretty similar, except uh, for us, we, we, we got too lazy, so we just ate the butter. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's why we're asking that. But anyway, to go back to the flow chart, is the page valuable outside of SEO? If you say yes, it says consider reposting the content on a different URL and you're directing this URL to a page that competes in SEO to better utilize links pointing to it. So that's exactly what I was describing. And if no, redirect the page to a more valuable page unless you think it's valuable to your business and gets traffic from other sources. So you can see how the flow chart works. Like you get to look at your checklist, you see all the shorts coming of the page, you have graded your page, and then you make a decision based on looking at this information and using the flowchart. So we have basically mapped out all potential scenarios in there. And uh, if we get more feedback, I'll keep updating it basically. That's kind of the beauty of a Notion template. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, the flowchart. So once you get there, you make a decision, you go in your Notion template and you decide, like, do I delete this? Do I redirect this? Do I update this? Do I leave it as is, et cetera. But the thing is like, Making a decision doesn't fix your website, right? It's not, it's not gonna do anything. You just have a Notion template with a decision assigned to a URL. That's, Google doesn't give a shit. Uh, what matters is you acting on your decisions and doing it fast and efficiently. So that's why we've actually built a full task system in our Notion system. So when you work on that page, when you're kind of like infused with the decision, the content, everything, like you, you, you are into it. Like you don't have to reread the page like six months later to do something you can actually write down all your tasks and then just queue them up. And they're associated to your URL and to all the metrics. So we build a test system that allows you to see, you know, the pages associated with, the tags that it's associated with, the types of, paid of um, 
the types of uh, tasks that it's associated with. So for example, you can tag the tasks as like 301s, for example, and do all your 301s at once, for example, which, uh, for example, like most people do use their 301s in their SEO plugin, terrible mistake. Uh, why? Because your SEO plugin is actually going to load your website and then redirect. It's very slow, basically, and resource intensive. So when Google follows it and it's heavy on their resources, you're eating your crawl budget. Uh, you're much better off using the mass Cloudflare 301 redirect manager that everyone can use. It's for free. It's on Cloudflare. And, uh, and we'll show you how to do that, actually, uh, in the blueprint. And so, like, essentially, you can take all your test tags uh, as 301, and you can do them all at once in the Cloudflare Mass Redirect Manager. You tick all these tasks at once because they're grouped together, and bam, that part of your audit is done. Same for the updates, same for everything. Uh, so it makes essentially acting on your decisions a lot easier. And that's that's what I was saying. Like I don't think we re reinvented the wheel here, but we've built like a nice slick process that allows you to actually get this stuff done in less time, less effort, and uh, and essentially make potentially less like good decisions. Like that's why the flow chart and the checklist, et cetera, are here is to like help you not mess it up because if you mess it up, you can really mess up your traffic you, as well. You said less good decisions. You mean less bad decisions, I'm sure. Less bad decisions, yeah. That's, no, I don't want to sell it. No, 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 that's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's essentially the whole process, right? Um, and, and the value added is like, you know, the checklists, the notion templates, it's the, the decision flow chart, the test system to make sure everything gets done, et cetera. So it's, a, it's streamlined, basically. That's kind of like what it works. And to be honest, every single site that has recovered from a large update has followed some kind of a similar system ever since Google penned that. I think that's when this kind of like came out originally. But the problem is like people like talk about this but don't really solve the practical problems on executing this, basically. And I think that's what we try to do with this blueprint. Couple questions. So how often should you run this process? Ideally, I'd say once a year. It's like, you know, we call it like, it's, it's like, it's for people who got affected by algorithm updates, but ideally you do this before you are affected, right? Because keeping your site clean is the, the most reliable way to make sure this doesn't happen to you. It's not for sure, like nothing's for sure with Google, right? And I, I don't wanna be that guy that's like, look, this is perfect, this is gonna work every time, etc." It's not even for sure gonna recover your website because we, we are not in control of Google. I can just tell you historically, that's what people have done to recover websites. But uh, but personally, like I would run it every year, like just pick a month of the year. I like January, like kind of like, you know, get a, do a big cleaning in January of your site every year. Uh, potentially update your title tags with the year, etc. Like uh, update your publish days. Do all these things that kind of like boost up your rankings anyway, uh, while you're kind of auditing the website. And that's a really, really good housekeeping exercise to do. Uh, and and we, we are going to keep doing that every year on the project to work on activity, actually. And if you're running a newer site, is this something you need to do quite quickly? Or at what stage does this become kind of relevant? Mm. Maybe after two years or something, like I don't think I would do it immediately. Like obviously, like what's the point of auditing something brand new? Like, you know, new sites kind of like obey different rules in a way, like they 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 need some time to establish themselves, et cetera. And then uh, if they do the things right, they will experience growth anyway. And it's like, you kind of need to see what grows, what doesn't, what sticks, what doesn't, and then you clean up once a year. So I would say like probably the two first years, I wouldn't bother too much. And then after that, I would slowly start, but you can kind of like be milder for the earlier years of your site. And as your site gets older and older pages, you're gonna have to be a lot harsher on these, uh, on these audits basically. And how critical do you think it is that you, the site owner, the business owner, the SEO, uh, make these decisions versus you know maybe outsourcing some of the some of this work? Mm, so I mean, for us, I didn't do all the decisions. For example, so we have someone who works on SEO, but I reviewed everything. Like um, like it's kind of like it was pre-done, you know. So mm -hmm. I had someone kind of like prepare the buckets of like, hey, here's what we want to delete, here's what we want to redirect, etc. Based on the rules I set, I think it's important to review it because this SEO person that does it for you, they might not understand what page is important to your business. And sometimes a page that doesn't get much traffic is extremely important to your business. And they'll delete it, you know? It's like, if they're not careful, they'll delete it or they'll redirect it, et cetera. It's, it's not good. Um, so it's like, there's a degree of like, knowing the business, not just knowing SEO to doing this. Um, so I don't think you need to do everything. I think you can definitely pass this on to someone else to essentially do up to the decision part and then go through this yourself and approve it. I think that's kind of like 
if you don't have time to do this, because it can be quite time consuming, especially for large sites, mm. I think that's the best way to do this. And, and the, the point of the template and the system is you can pass this on to someone and review it in a convenient format in the Notion database, basically. And if, you're, if your site has 10,000 pages, are, are you literally going through all 10,000 pages and making a decision on this? Sounds like it's going to take a long time. Mm, I mean, it's not as bad because the template kind of like buckets things for you. Yeah. So you're very likely to have lots of pages with like no traffic, no links. It's just going to bucket these. And it's like, yeah, you, you see the URL, you see the page title, and you see no traffic, no link. And then it's like, you know, you kind of like tag them really, like you, I select 10 or 15 in a batch or something, and I just like flag them all as delete, for example. If, if you have thousands of pages as well, you, you tend to have categories and you might make a decision across yeah. the category, like we did with the, the funnel category, which is like, okay, well, let's get rid of the whole thing here. And it's, it's yeah. quicker than going through them all one by one. But the buckets helps a lot, like the automatic bucketing of pages through the Ahrefs and GSC data. It's like it's it saves so much time because once it's there and you see all these metrics in one dashboard, uh, you know, quite often, yeah, we're selecting chunks of 20 pages, 30 pages. And like they will go for redirect or deletion or whatever. Uh, it was like correct 80 percent of the time, I would say. And then 20 percent of the time, I would probably make a different decision. Uh, so it, it's it still takes time, but it saves time to do it that way. So how does this then impact this concept of topical authority where we want to be covering, you know, everything to do with our niche or our industry? I mean, are we going to be deleting half the pages and wrecking that or what's the what's the plan? Yeah, it's interesting, right? It's like the like on one side you have people that essentially want to add more pages on their site and then on the other side I'm telling you delete a bunch of stuff. Uh I think that, that these concepts can live together. It's really about I mean, to, it's like whether you want to believe in topical authority, that's fine. The question is, what is the quality of the execution of that content, right? So um, if you're doing low quality content, then potentially your pages get low quality score. And despite the fact that you're covering a lot of topics, your site is going to get spanked. And honestly, you can find plenty of examples of that following the recent updates, right? It's like, I, I don't think topical authority is a way to protect your website. However, if you execute your content properly, it's well maintained and everything, and you use a process like this one to make sure your page, you know, you know, goes well with everything Google's looking for, etc. Then I think it's completely fine. I think it potentially works together. So it's like I'm not saying make tiny sites only. I'm saying don't bite more than you can chew and make sites that you can actually maintain properly because I think that matters a lot for Google. So it's like a good example is like Healthline, right? Healthline is big health site, lots of pages, etc. But all pages are executed on a pretty high level. Google rewards them, like they're, they're doing very well, right? Um, but then you can find many more bloated sites that have lots of pages but not executed well that get tanked in the updates. I, I think part of the reason for that is because it's it's easy to to create content and to build processes to do it, but it's much harder to, to maintain. know when to stop so that you can maintain that content at the real best of the best kind of standard that's necessary across your entire site in order to to kind of realize all these gains and stuff. And so, yeah, that's the challenge. It's not just like building the site, it's maintaining it and lasting over time, which is where you make the real money, right? It's like, yeah. it sucks to to climb all the way there to just fall off yeah. when you actually get there. Like you're, you're expected to actually, to last long enough to actually make your money back, you know? So potentially the challenge of building large sites is, is maybe more than what people thought it was, right? Because it's one thing to get there, it's another thing to stay. But you can absolutely, you know, have your topical map, do all your topics, etc. But once a year, go through all your content and make sure it's still in line. Potentially, that improves your topical authority because you're looking at what's ranking, you're looking at what new topics are associated with your pages, etc. You re-add them in there and that helps you out. So it's like, like I think topical authority, it's not necessarily a bad concept and it potentially is how Google works. But it has pushed people to produce lots of low quality content and blow their it's sites. It's the execution with, with bad of stuff. it. Like if you if you lower your standards too much, there's other factors can come into play. Exactly. So while it technically it, it may be how this works, um, I don't think for people with very limited resources it's necessarily a good framework because they should focus more on creating fewer good pages than many low quality pages. Um, when you have larger amount of resources, I think it, it comes at play. Uh, it's a little bit more practical, basically. Mm. Um, so that that's how it works. I don't think I don't think th these are particularly like opposed uh, strategies. It's just but like quality of execution is often lacking in this industry. And 
and and and this audit process helps you open the eyes on potentially your lack of quality execution. It did on ours, it, and quite often, like you know, you you realize that like when you do the audit and it's just gonna bucket your pages. For some sites, like eighty percent of the pages are gonna land to the delete bucket, you know, um, and it's like. That that begs questions, right? You just spent all this money creating all this content you're about to delete if you follow this process. Is it really worth keeping doing the same thing, or should you actually update the way you create content? You know, like is there is there is there a better way to do this that potentially gets you better results down the line? And so um, so that's gonna open up all these kind of like philosophical questions on on how you create content and how you do things, etc. Which is a good thing. It's like a good questioning once a year. Like, are we doing the right thing? Is this actually helping us? Uh, or should we change direction and we optimize things? It's really a healthy thing to do in a content business. And this process will help you do that, which uh, is another perk of doing this. You know? I think I think that kind of plays into the, the kind of long-term results here. Because we're not saying, hey, go do a site audit and you'll get full recovery from HCU. That's, that's just not the case. And the thing as well is like, you need to another update. Like quite often you do these audits and it's like, it, don't expect results tomorrow. I'm not going to say that either. Like uh, quite often you need Google to press the button again and then potentially you get a recovery and it's not guaranteed either. What I can tell you is everyone who's recovered has done something similar. That's, that's, that's the, that's the truth, you know? Yeah. So, so, but like in general is going to ask you questions, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm firing people usually after this process. Uh, I'm like I'm pointing fingers at people who do bad stuff, etc., and identify things that that could be done better. Uh, and I think it's just a healthy thing to do rather than just keep going as we've always done, not change anything, and then bam, one day minus eighty percent traffic, you know. And and honestly, we've been we've been guilty of that on previous sites, right? It's happened to us, and it's like I think this process is gonna make things. Uh, it's like it hasn't happened to us on Autoria Hacker because we're a bit more proactive on, on this. Uh, and, and we do this before it goes bad, basically. Yeah, I mean, that's the process. Again, I know this corner of the industry can be a bit shady and people will promise you a lot of things, etc. I don't want to make these promises, but I want to tell you that this is a healthy thing to do for your site. This is something that people we cover actually end up doing. Uh, and what we've done is we've streamlined the process and make it made it easier, basically. And uh, the best thing, if you're an AH Pro member, is you can actually get this blueprint right now in our new members area. It's uh, it's available right now. So head on over to members.authorityhacker.com if you're an AH Pro member. If you're not an AH Pro member, first, what are you doing with your life? Um, and <laughs> second, uh, you can pick up this blueprint. Uh, a week today. So that's going to be on Monday, the 18th of March. And it will be available as part of a bundle of blueprints and resources and bonuses. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what's included, Gil? Yeah, so I've made a module on technical audit as well. So I'm still using the Ahrefs free site audit tool because actually it surfaces a lot of technical issues if you have them. Uh, and for example, like I'll give you an example of a member who had his non slash URLs at the end of the URL not redirect to his slash URLs at the end of the URL. And he was getting links to both, right? It's not too bad when you have a rel canonical, like rel canonical is supposed to fix that basically, but it's still not great. Like it's like essentially your links go through something a little bit lower than a redirect. Uh, and so like he, it, this helped him identify these kind of issues and uh, told him how to fix it on Cloudflare in the member area. Uh, and uh, essentially helps you cover some ground that a content audit will not cover. And we've included the EAT blueprint as well. Again, we've talked about EAT quite a lot in this episode. Originally, I was not a believer of EAT, and now I think EAT is a factor through correlation, uh, just because essentially the sites that have been deemed as helpful by quality writers have these kind of on-page factors. If you correlate with these sites, you're more likely to be deemed as helpful by a machine learning algorithm and therefore, implementing a bunch of these things isn't a good idea on your website. Is this going to fix your website from issue on its own? I don't think so. I think you need to do the content audit as well. I think you need to look in your tech as well. And so that's why we kind of made that bundle because it kind of like covers most grounds. Uh, and there's actually a bonus as well where I audit a bunch of pages as well. So, you know, the blueprint shows the process and, and walks you through it. And I just recorded like a, an extra video where I just go through a bunch of pages that were maybe challenging in audits we've done and things like that and kind of like talks through um, you know, why we've done things and, and why you may consider that so that we can get a little bit more like in the trenches and, and, and doing it in real life on real sites, basically. So that's pretty much the bundle. So this is going to be available for just a few days. 
uh, from next Monday. So make sure you're subscribed to our email list. Go to authorityhacker.com forward slash subscribe to do that if you want to be notified of this. Uh, and it's worth doing because there will be a big discount as well if you're on there. So I highly recommend that. All right, cool. Well, that's pretty much the episode. Whether you buy the blueprint or not, I hope this was helpful. This made you think about how to manage your website, etc. Uh, we always want to provide value on this podcast. It's not just a sales fest, so hopefully that was good. Uh, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, subscribe, and let us know what you thought of it in the comments. And let us know what topics in the podcast you'd like us to cover as well or what guests you'd like us to have. We're always looking to kind of like expand the podcast. I think the interviews have been really good lately. I've been really happy with it. I've learned a lot personally. Uh, I know the last one I did on uh, well, side speed was pretty nerdy, but I kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so yeah, pretty much. Let us know in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We had a ton of fun doing it. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you like this one, I think you'll also enjoy this one. So check it out. <laughs>